morning, Los Angeles. Hello, fans of Major League Soccer. Hello, lovers of the black and gold. Hello to the millions. And millions. Of defenders of the bank listeners and an extra special hello to all of our friends and all of our haters. 13 miles down the 110. This is Defenders of the Bank, the LAFC podcast run by two credentialed season ticket holding knuckleheads. This will be a fun and jovial one because nothing feels better than to beat your rival. Don't care what the sport is. Rivalry games always mean something to not only the players, but the fans, and it feels good to beat Emery, 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 enemy numero uno, especially when that enemy was undefeated and off to their best start since 2010. But we'll go into details momentarily. Introductions are in order before we begin. My name is Christian Philemon, otherwise known as Philly, otherwise known as the semi-platinum-haired flamingo, also known as one happy and jovial podcaster. And joining me, as he does on almost every pod, the gorilla monsoon of my Bobby the Brain Heenan, the peanut butter to my jelly, the ice to my tequila, La Bufanda himself, J.R. Lieber, the the scarf. And guys, uh, look, I, I didn't party too hard. I didn't drink too much. I didn't do anything other than come back from Puerto Rico and get under the weather real quick. So this sultry baritone voice, Jonathan Reimer, don't worry, bud. I'm not coming for your job or anything. He's got that that sultry baritone voice. No, this is just all I got this morning, you guys. I, I tried to cheer. I, I tried to do whatever it was I could last night. And let me tell you, there was a lot to cheer and be excited about last night. But man, oh man, oh man, uh, look, what an incredible win. And and look, I, I'm going to say one thing, because I don't get to say this this confidently this often. The game went pretty much exactly as I thought it would with Carson playing directly into LAFC's hands, their stats, their passes, everything. The, the eye test did not pass muster when you look deeper into the stats. We talked about it on One More Sleep, and now Philly, the best part is we get to talk about three massive points in a rivalry game at home. No, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know why the thought just dawned on me, but I'm pretty sure I know exactly where you blew out your vocal cords. It was after Denny scored the penalty kick, we're high five and everybody in Founders Club. I look over at you and you're like in your Daniel Bryan, yes, like like position. And you pause for a second, and then I heard you go, Let's go. I think about that moment in time is where you blew out your vocal cords. I'm pretty so, sure. Tell me, tell me I'm not wrong. Yeah. So you ever look, I'm part of the zero club all the time, which is where you let your gas tank go all the way down to zero miles left before you luckily you pull into the gas wife. station, right? You, you ever been there before where you look down at the gas tank and you're like, all right, I know there's an Arco like a mile and a half up the road. I can totally make it there. No problem. My hands were up. I was debating. I was doing all the calculations in the head. I was like, how much voice do I have left? Is this really going to be a good idea? Where am I going to spend all this? And I said, yeah, I can make it to the gas station a mile up the road. And absolutely, I was cheering so loud for Denis. Uh, I got to ask Denny a really fun question that he gave me a sheepish look for in the press conference after the match. But uh, man, what uh, what a way to dampen the already dull spirits of those living in Carson. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, for, it's funny because it was the more recent thing, but I totally forgot about the question you address, You asked Denny. We, we have to make sure we remember to address that towards the end of the pod because oh, it was shall. really good and sheepish was certainly the uh, the... the Perfect adjective to describe exactly his thoughts on it. But what a great day, full day of tailgating. Forgot how much fun, but also tiring it could be being out there for long uh, periods of time. But fortunately, the game started early. I don't know if I would have been able to tackle three more hours of tailgating, then going into BMO, then coming out, then being up at this hour. Normally, I'm not a morning person. And neither, I mean, Scarf's, I don't know what kind of person he is. The guy doesn't sleep. Let's just put it that way. But and we're doing this early, not because we enjoy waking up early on Sundays, but because I got to call a baseball game at one o'clock. So I want to say thank you to you, Scarf. And of course, everybody joining us right now, the millions. And millions. Joining us on this early morning pod. Figure y'all wanted to celebrate last night and be jovial anyway. Might have had a couple of 
Adult beverages last night might have been a little too loosey-goosey with the words. Might have said some things I really mean, but I didn't want to necessarily say. So I figured this would be the safer bet. Plus, this man looked like he was going to pass right out. At this point, I, order I, I, five, scarf zero. I was exhausted after the match. Uh, yeah, get in the car, son. We're going home. Uh, Soccer USA, Genuine Cougar, Ben, Jorge, uh, everybody, Oscar in the chat. You guys, good morning, good morning, good morning. We love all of you, and thank you for joining us. I uh, want to remind everybody that the Mofasio Futsal Court fundraising effort is still going on. Uh, so head on over to lafc.com backslash mo Fasio to make sure you get your donation on What's Good, ISIS. Uh, and again, we want to do our very quick things that we we do in every episode, get these out of the way so that you guys can get a little more informed and have a little bit more fun with us this day in LAFC history and news and notes. Uh, look, the match was played on the 6th, which was Saturday. So let's do a little bit of history from April 6th. Back in 2019, LAFC crushes DC United in the nation's capital, and this game was everywhere fox was talking about it espn was talking about it because it was wayne rooney against the upstart lafc in their second season and the matchup did not live up to the billing in fact it was an early tko for lafc we crushed the dc united for nothing diego rossi with a hat trick following a carlos vela goal Carlos Vela also missed his first MLS PK in that one. Uh, but the third goal for Diego Rossi was goal number 100 for LAFC across all competitions. And the reason why the matchup didn't live up to the billing, because Waza, Waza himself, that's right, 52nd minute red card for Waza. So Wayne Rooney hit the showers early. Uh, it was Mohamed El Munir making his LAFC debut. We're going to talk about another LAFC debut at the end of this match. And then LAFC, of course, became the first team to have two different players notch a hat trick in back-to-back -back road games. It was the first time ever in MLS history that an MLS team is at a plus nine goal differential in back-to-back -back away wins. Uh, so that was April 6th, 2019. And real quick, since you're all listening to this on April 7th, 2018, uh, we can't forget that day, uh, LAFC got absolutely shellacked 5 nothing on the road to Atlanta, the eventual MLS Cup champions. That was the Joao Moutinho nightmare meltdown with a red card in the 92nd minute. And that is this day in LAFC history. The chat is so alive and rocking right now. We got Mikey A, King Lachero, Ruben, everybody just absolutely lighting up the chat. Philly's doing a good job on the ones and twos of showing you all the comments there. <laughs> now, while you're uh, going through puberty right now, yeah. I just wanted to say, those, those couple games that you mentioned, it's funny how one can easily remember where they were at certain moments that like, had that, uh, that memory to it. That DC United game on the road, I remember it distinctly because that was one of the last times I was back home in New York City. That actually was unfortunately one of the last times I got to see my grandmother. But I remember we were all huddled around the TV waiting to watch that game. That was, you know, it was fun. Build as Vela versus Rooney, like you said. But yeah, that it didn't go, didn't go that well. And then that game against Atlanta United, Panda and I were down in San Diego at this place called the Shakespeare Pub. Really cool spot in San Diego for checking out football matches, uh, especially uh, of English Premier League. So it's just funny some of the things that pop through your head. I didn't yeah. think about any I of this. Wanna... You mentioned it. Sorry, God, I was gonna say I want to do a smooth segue with Defenders of the Bank. You're you're you said that was a lot one of the last times you were home. I'm real jealous, man. You're you're going home and you're gonna get to be at an event that uh, look I, I would love to be a part of. Yeah, so I'm going to go home, Defenders, for the first time in four years. I'm going back to New York City on Wednesday with, with Panda, of course. And I'm going to get to see my mom and dad, who, again, I have not seen since February of 2020. Stopped by in New York before Panda and I went off to Rome. On the way back from Rome, we stopped in New York for a split second. Got on back to L.A. because we cut our trip short because that was the game in which uh, Inner Miami was set to come in. The Bank of California Stadium, the opening day, I wasn't going to miss Inner Miami's first day and the opportunity to potentially meet David Beckham because I don't know if many of you are aware of this. Scarf, yes, is a math, math, a math and Latin teacher, and one of his students was Brooklyn Beckham. 
Imagine that. You're doing your parent-teacher conference, and you're talking to Posh Spice and David Beckham. Pretty cool stuff. And true to form, we did meet David Beckham that day. It was the trippiest thing, Defenders. We're up in Founders, coming up the stairs, coming right off the elevators, Beck's and his entire uh, detail of people. And it was a simple, David, it was a simple JR. And they embraced. And all of us around were just looking like, I don't get starstruck. I don't give up about most people, but I mean, I love Beckham because I'm a Manchester United guy and God, who doesn't love David Beckham? Anyway, I am obviously kicking the can down because I want to make sure your throat doesn't die, but it's funny for me because I'm going to keep calling you pubert for the remainder of this podcast. Yeah, thanks. Good good looking out. But anyway, what I wanted Philly to talk about is he's going to the Doc Gooden number retirement ceremony. He got all squirreled. And, oh, yeah, uh, that part. About- he got all he got all hot and bothered talking about David Beckham there. So uh yeah, no, man, I'm real I'm real jealous. You get to go to the Doc Good and Retirement Ceremony. Uh that would be great. Uh wanna I want to get your thoughts on this comment too, Philly, from Eduardo in the chat. Yesterday, LAFC beat Carson. Today, Cody Rhodes finishes the story. Is Cody gonna finish the story or is it gonna be more of the same in WWE? Eduardo, at the end of tonight, possibly on the next podcast, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement and it's going to be on behalf of myself and the tribal and the tribal leader. Acknowledge <laughs> us. Nah, it's going to be Roman Reigns, baby. I hope so. Anyway. I love it. All right. Let's, let's get back real quick into the one news and note that by the way, I couldn't find on LAFC.com. So I LAFC PR, if I'm wrong, let me know. Carlos Mariscal, if I'm wrong, let me know. But I saw number 91 on the bench yesterday. That's Luis Muller. So I'm going to assume that LAFC again signed Luis Muller to one of those short-term contracts that we do, uh, which also will make it pretty unlikely, by the way, that Luis Muller is playing in LAFC 2's match today, which is in Tacoma. So I don't know if maybe they got him on like a quick flight to get back out to Tacoma or not. We'll see uh, LAFC2 taking on Tacoma Defiance today, April 7th at 5 p.m. Uh, so I don't know, uh, Luis Muller playing or not, but in order for him to be on the bench, he either signed a first-team contract, which I don't think is the case, uh, or he signed one of those short-term deals. So I want to remind everybody, Luis Muller wearing number 91. He actually, we were sitting, and our buddy Dario, who sits right behind us, he goes, hey, you said there'd be that new big German kid in the lineup. He's in the 18. Where is he? And I look over and I see, I see Kai Kamara. I see Maxime Cheneau. I see, you know, Nathan Ordaz and all the other guys who we know warming up on the side. And I go, yeah, it's crazy. I don't see him. And I look down on the bench behind the coaching staff and there he is in his green bib, just kind of sitting there getting a really good seat to watch the game. So I don't know if they ever had any attention in putting Louis Muller into the game, but he is certainly fun to watch for LAFC too. And then real quick, just want to remind everybody. Yeah, I'll get there. I'll get there. Uh, Just want to remind everybody uh, that ACFC Angel City plays away to the Chicago Red Stars Saturday, April 13th at 6.30 p.m. And for all your ACFC news, please make sure you tune in to the Angel City Chicks on any platform that you listen to your podcasts. All right, Philly, hit the chat. He's, he's just, guys, I, we also do this on YouTube, but Philly is just pointing uh, down at the thing. Uh, I want you to do the shameless plug for the shirts, if you don't mind. All righty. So, Defenders, we've been kind of delaying the, uh, what, well, should not have been delayed, but that's besides the point. We have merch. We absolutely have merch. And it's not the kind of merch that you will find at our tent on a tailgate day, although we do have scarves. We have T-shirts to sell, and eventually we'll have a bunch of other cool things to sell as well. But if you head to DefendersOfTheBank.com, there is a tab. It's called Shop. If you click it, it'll bring you over to 500 level, officially licensed Defenders of the Bank apparel. And if you filter through, there are all kinds of great things for men, women, and kids. We've got long sleeve shirts. We've got tank tops. We've got sweaters. Chris Lafferty bought himself a brilliant Fill a Monster Studios t-shirt. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that, my friend, because you had this <laughs> really bad acknowledge this comment in the chat. And had I and I haven't done this before. I was almost about to put you in a timeout. But you totally redeemed yourself with the purchase of a Fill a Monster Studios t-shirt. So check it out, defendersofthebank.com. You'll see the tab shop on the upper side. 
Take a look, see. All these designs were done by our graphic designer, Dexter uh, Quinn, and of course, with some input from JR, the scarf, and myself as well. Awesome t shirts. Finally got around to doing it, and we have four pages worth of merch. I didn't even know that we had four pages of merch. <laughs> if you look at some of the things, like for example, page two, the Defenders of the Bank logo, if you think it looks very similar to Saved by the Bells logo, that show from the 80s that we all grew up on, you are right. A lot of those things are very similar to a lot of really cool logos. And eventually there will be a t-shirt on there that I'm going to love and wear the heck out of. It's my Philly 316 t-shirt. I love it. But you got an awesome Oasis style Defenders t-shirt, all kinds of good stuff. And I can't wait to be see I'm rocking all this on Christmas tree lane. Hopefully I get to see a couple of you out there wearing it as well. But DefendersOfTheBank.com, shop, check it out. Yeah, look, Genuine Cougar, Soccer USA, Lafferty, everybody else who's already uh, who's already patronized the shop, we really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. And again, if there's something you want to see us make merch out of, let us know, dude. We'll put up a new idea. 500 Level has been incredible working with us. want to say a big thank you to everybody at 500 Level. Uh, real quick, also, I was going to do this at the top, but I totally forgot. want to give a quick shout out to anybody at Willows who's listening to this podcast because my middle schoolers were talking to me all about, oh, we got to listen to your podcast when you get back. I'm curious to see how many of you guys uh, actually do listen. Love you all. So thank you. Well, guys like your middle schoolers, like you're all are going through puberty together at the same yeah. time. My voice is such a disaster right now. I, I really, I, I really appreciate you guys getting through this. This is this is a tough one. Soccer USA, try to fit into the onesie. Do what you can, make it happen. Uh, all right, Philly. We had a lot of fun pre-match festivities. Of course, the tailgate and official fan fest. By the way, uh, shout out Remitly was giving away these little LAFC speakers. Those were really cool. Lexus was giving away these LAFC portable like phone charger banks. That was pretty cool. There was a lot of cool stuff being given away by a lot of the uh, the activations and the sponsors over on FanFest. But still, there's nothing like a Derby Day tailgate out on Christmas Tree Lane. Yeah, the party was fun on Christmas Tree Lane. ton of people roaming around. And anytime there is a, um, a FanFest, that pushes everybody uh from the supporter side a little further down the street but the nice thing about that is is as we're all compact in there it just looks a lot more full and there were times that it did look more full i would say the vast majority of the time it looked more full on our end of christmas tree lane than it did in the activations part uh, i think they would really benefit from opening things up a little so we could easily traverse to and from that would open things up that's just my my call apparently i don't know if it's a sponsors thing wanting to separate that but i'm a little bummed that i didn't get the little speaker thing that would have been cool the only thing i saw that you wanted to get again was that continental tire scarf and i've already gotten one or two of them you probably have 2700 of them for <laughs> every venue you go to so i didn't feel the need to get one of those but it was fun it was jovial gosh and it was the perfect time to 4 30 kickoff on a saturday is perfect just enough time to tailgate, just enough time to relax, just enough time to get in a BMO without having like your head smashed into a, a bottle of whatever it is that you're drinking. So uh, the party should always be afterwards, by the way. Not necessarily. Uh, I, I would like to point out, uh, we're up to number two if you're counting how many times Philly has used the word jovial today. I love it. Uh, hey, all right. There's a, there's that, that's going to be that Pee Wee Herman's uh, house of whatever the, the heck. The word of the day, word. right? The secret word. By the way, that comes, from, that, that comes from the god Jupiter. Jove is what he was known as. So it was those people influenced by the god Jupiter. Jove. That's what jovial means. There you go. All right. LAFC, take it on Carson. Before the match, Christmas Tree Lane was electric inside the stadium. We were all a little nervous because, uh, Ollie went on walkabout last time, uh, and and it was funny. It was uh, uh, it was Elizabeth Banks, right? Uh, where they said Ollie was having her mocking Jay moment or whatever it was because of Elizabeth Banks from Hunger Games last time. No, no issues with Ollie this time, but I think that's because she knew there was an old friend in the building as the honorary Falconer, and he got his his commemorative jersey before the match as well. And and look, I'm not gonna lie, I was out there uh, watching. As Gareth Bale, the video montage was played, right? And and I just, Cheeky Palacios streaking down to the end line, making an absolutely dot of a pass to Gareth Bale, dunking on uh, Happy Jack Elliott there. And, and it was just, 
I got I got goosebumps. I got shivers all up and down my spine. It was so cool to relive that moment. You imagine what it must be like to be Gareth Bale looking at the Jumbotron, reliving that moment, knowing how much it means to the 22,000 in the stadium, to all of the LAFC faithful, and of course, to the millions. And millions. Yeah, it was it was so cool seeing Gareth Bale back in the building as the honorary Falconer and, and just being able to honor him one more time. You know, the funny thing is, I didn't realize it was Gareth Bale from a distance because gone is the man bun, something he's pretty much had since he left Tottenham. I don't recall the last time I'd seen Gareth Bale without the man bun. And if you saw the video of him going in through um, from where like the teams park underneath the tunnel, underneath BMO Stadium, he kind of looked like the grown up, more buff version of the young boy in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought as Gareth Bale was rolling in with that hairdo. And I have to quote Max Bredos's tweet. It's a shame that Gareth Bale let himself go. I mean, not playing <laughs> football. It's just a shame. He still looks like he can ball. It would have been awesome to still have him on this team. Could you imagine if we would have had him last year as well? What that could have at least done for us in moments of despair, like the MLS Cup final against the Columbus crew. Uh, I don't know. That could have been something. But, yeah, it was a great way to do things. Uh, I didn't even know he was coming through. But, I mean, he spends a lot of time out here golfing and whatnot. So, hey, Gareth Bale, bringing us good luck, obviously, because we won last night. Absolutely. Great luck by Gareth Bale. And let's just talk real quick, too, about the TIFO. A wonderful job once again by the 3252. Uh, I think this one will go down as what the abandoned towers TIFO, right? Because you got the uh, the three towers in the background commemorating the uh, those three abandoned towers right next to Staples Center with all the graffiti and everything. Uh, you know, some of it, Philly, from our angle, right? It was a little hard to make out. It looked like there might have been maybe a comment or two towards Carson on there. I couldn't, I, I couldn't quite from our vantage point see uh, the comment uh, towards Carson, uh, but we absolutely loved all the shout outs to the different supporters groups out there. That was pretty cool. I don't know. Rumor has it. There was a something about Carson on the TIFO, but what I loved is all the way up at the top where right next to D9U's, it said Mo forever on there too. So it was really cool to get the shout out for Mo on that TIFO as well. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it was it was awesome. I you had the Mortal Kombat vibes on there as well, because obviously that's what it is. Anytime we go up against the galaxy, it is Mortal Kombat. It is death to the galaxy and butter sauce. Um, <laughs> it was, what a way to start things off! G gave us all goosebumps. It was uh, yeah, it was fun. And then you saw up in that upper right corner how their supporters came in. And I love how they love they call us plastic and our front office pays for everything. And then Paul Tenorio from The Athletic reports that the Galaxy front office paid for all of them to go in to BMO Stadium. And uh, yeah, some of them were very disrespectful about that, as I saw plenty of them getting escorted out by, by security. But they came in, as they usually do, with their little bits of confetti, sprinkling things through. And then the balloons. The balloons are probably the most annoying part of it all. I've already grown accustomed. To the little confetti but the balloons <laughs> look man the clowns carry balloons and that's just what i'm gonna say about that you know i i want to give a shout out though you you will not hear me be this complimentary about carson fans very often but i i got i got someone to compliment inside that they said there were a thousand i don't know that there were a thousand carson no fans, but either way no if you notice on twitter right in the middle right in the middle of that section Towards the end of the match, there was a guy holding a giant yellow banner. And did you see what the giant yellow banner said in the middle? I applaud this supporter for Carson. Somos Carson. <laughs> Somos Carson. They are finally owning the fact that they are Carson. I, I really appreciate whatever Galaxy supporter was up there and said, you know what, guys? It's time to put all this ridiculousness aside of wanting to claim that we are actually part of Los Angeles. Let's just own who we are. Somos Carson. That is awesome. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, now let's get into some starting lineups. Yeah. By the way, you mentioned Ollie real quick. She almost took Jason's arm off. I thought it was just Ken uh, last season. She almost took Jason's arm off to Ollie 
is feisty. And when she's not feisty, she's horny and flies away. Hilarious. I mean, look, uh, last thing I'm going to do is mess with Ollie ever. Uh, it's a bird of prey. And and our, our Falcons are absolutely terrifying. I saw Ollie go right by my face right before she went on walkabout uh, last match. So that's definitely for sure. All right. I'm going to try to struggle through this lineup. You guys, again, for those of you that have stuck around for the first 25 minutes with my voice the way it is, I, I am a little under the weather today. So I appreciate all of you uh, sticking around. It was uh, Greg Vanny once again at the helm. And look, Greg Vanny is a very solid coach in Major League Soccer. If he wasn't coaching for Carson, I'd be a little bit more complimentary of his exploits. But he coaches for the Herbalife Sash. So I'm just going to say he's a solid coach in Major League Soccer. Ran out the 4-3-3. And he'd be missing uh, one very key piece off the bench and, and a player who I think has a very realistic shot at playing for the under 23s uh, in the Olympics for Team USA at some point too. Out, out was Jalen Neal, uh, who I think is a big piece of that back line, and Eric Zavaleta, who, by the way, Eric Zavaleta is still in Major League Soccer. I feel like that's one of those guys where every four or five years I look over and, wow, Eric Zavaleta is still playing somewhere. Cool. Uh, so those two guys out. What's that? Wasn't he in OCSC recently? I, I, something like that. Yeah, he was on Seattle Sounders for a while. He's been all over the map, Eric Zavaleta. Uh, we knew their keeper coming in, no, and and look, for for all of the for all of the grief and ridiculousness that we will continue to give John McCarthy because John, you could have chose any any club, bud, and, and you chose Carson. Uh, we know they handed you a giant bag of money, and and you deserved it. You earned it, and I will never begrudge an athlete for taking the money and earning their starting spot and, and wanting to go play in a place where they will pay you well and play you well. And that's certainly what Carson will be doing this season, but you chose wrong. That's all I got to say. I love you, but you chose wrong. Uh, John McCarthy and goal had a very, very good game. John McCarthy had a solid game. Uh, on the back line, Julian Aude, Edwin Cerillo, Mickey Yamane, and a player who now I really don't like after watching him play 90 minutes. All due respect to the Japanese national teamer, Maya Yoshida. But, dude, if if I didn't think some of my middle schoolers were watching this, I, I would have to use a, a different adjective to describe him. But he was a little baby uh, all throughout the match. I did not love Maya Yoshida. Uh, in the midfield, Philly, you talked ad nauseum about how talented this midfield is, and I kept waiting for them to show up, and you're absolutely right. They are extremely talented, but we'll talk about why LAFC played the absolute perfect game plan in this match a little bit later. But Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, Marky Delgado, Gaston Brugman, and, of course, Ricky Pooch rounding out the midfield. And up top, two players who were virtually – invisible for most of the match in Joseph Painsel and Gabriel Peck. And uh, Peck reminds me of Ghostbusters, the uh, inspector from uh, EPA, Walter Peck, who comes in, uh, except I like Walter Peck more than I like Gabriel Peck. And that's not saying a lot because I don't like Walter Peck. It's true, Peck. Your Honor. This man has no... <laughs> Uh, he's apparently in the new one, too. I can't wait to go see it. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, and then uh, Dejan Jovalich and all five of his goals up top for Carson. Just two players to mention uh, on the bench. That would be Miguel Berry and long, long time MLSer who might go down as like the most games played in MLS history if he keeps going. Diego Fagundes. Yes, Diego Fagundes. Not going to lie. Pardon me. Uh shivered a little bit when he came into the game, but we'll talk about it. We'll address that in the second half. For LAFC, we have been very consistent with maintaining our starting lineups with the one exception. Uh, Omar Campos started off the season uh, in, the, in, the, in the outside back role, and since then, he went down and plop. He got hurt. He didn't play last week. He had an ankle injury. Uh, but Sergi Palencia has been in the lineup, and I'm gonna, I don't think I'm going out on a massive limb by saying he's the starter. At this point, he is the rightful starter in that position, and I'm so glad that he was in there because I was terrified of uh, thinking of Joseph Paintsill running down on his side of the pitch, sprinting by Omar Campos, who's coming back from, from uh, an ankle situation. So Sergi Palencia, Aaron Long, Jesus David Murillo, and Ryan Hollingshead. Midfield, and this is where I was going to be a little worried because I thought this game would be won or lost in the midfield, uh, and it was certainly won by us. Timothy Tillman, Ilya Sanchez, and Edward Atuesta. Up top, Kike Oliveira, Matus Bogush, and Denny Bawanga. As far as the substitutions are concerned, one that we would not see is David Martinez because the kid 
17 years old, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He uh, got a got a schmuck wow. red card last week. Total schmuck red card, and that's all I'm going to say about him. The only substitutions that LAFC had were late in the game. Kai Kamara makes his BMO Stadium debut, and Maxime Chanel makes not only his BMO Stadium debut, but his LAFC debut, former member of NYCFC. That is your starting lineup. Yeah. I don't know if Hugo Lloris. Hey, that guy, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hugo, uh, turns out, uh, Philly, uh, you met, you went out on a limb about Palencia. I'm going to go out on a limb about Hugo Lloris. He's good. He's very good. Yeah. yeah. I just thought I it was knew good. that, though. Yeah. All right. So Hugo in the third minute had to make a big save, uh, already kind of being tested. And I thought, okay, this is going to be back and forth. And I don't know that if LAFC uh, can hang in a track meet uh, with this club. Uh, but then just like that, Philly, we talked about how in two different matches this season, Carson has scored in the third minute and in the fourth minute. And it was going to have to be something that we we really press hard to make sure we don't allow an early one for Carson in this match. Well, Timothy, uh, Timothy Tillman, who uh, Steve Trundolo in the press conference said, I think he's been our most consistent player on the year this year. And, and look, I've talked about wanting to potentially sit him at times if we can get a player up top as a nine and move Matty Bogush back into the midfield. I, I, I don't know now that you can take Timothy Tillman off the pitch because he is always in the right spot. And if I had more of a voice... I would say it the way that Kevin Hart said it in his stand-up, but when Timothy Tillman scored the goal, he said it with his chest. That's right. I was so happy to see Timothy Tillman back post, almost like in the Nashville game. He just kind of crept in there on the back post and boop, with his chest, scores the goal. Philly, I lost my mind. We're up four minutes in, one nothing. Could not be a better start for LAFC. It was a brilliant start, especially considering how aggressive the Galaxy came out. And had it been a different keeper other than a Hugo Lloris, I don't know if we're that jovial 60 seconds later. But it was a great, great distribution off the corner by Bogush that found <laughs> him in. And if you go back and see the replay, how was he so wide open, by the way? How was he so wide open? But if you look in previous games, I don't know if Galaxy's – uh, set piece defense has been all that good. I've talked at nauseum about how I think their defense is their Achilles heel. And it certainly was their Achilles heel at that moment. You could drive a semi through John McCarthy and the space that he had with Timothy uh, getting that ball into the back of the net. But what a great way to start. But against this Galaxy team, this isn't a Galaxy team you would feel comfortable with, uh, against unless you had a 4 nothing lead. All season long, they have come back time and time again, being down 1-0, 2-0. Diego Fagundes said it himself. I mentioned it on One More Sleep. This is a team that still believes they can win when being down by a, a big margin. So that was a good way to get things started for sure. Yeah, Philly, Steve Chirondolo said it like four times in the press conference too, how confident he was about LAFC's ability to own the set pieces, whether that was defending or whether that was where we had the opportunities on set pieces. And, and Trundle must have absolutely been working on some things in training because uh, you mentioned it, the space, the goal, everything. It just, it seemed like it all went according to plan. And again, the game planning by Steve Trundle and the coaching staff for this match, Galaxy played right into our hands. The line from Dennis Green, uh, they are who we thought they were, uh, mm -hmm. is exactly right when it came to the way that Carson played in this match. Uh, great back post cross from Sergi Palencia to Nibuanga in the 10th minute, deflected out for a corner. Look, I, I was wrong on one thing for sure. And while I think he played a good game, I said that it would have to be Matty Bogush's best match of the season. He would have to be everywhere all the time over the course of 90 minutes. Matty's set pieces were pretty terrible, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, his Not the first one. Yeah, no, absolutely. But for everything after that, he was trying to score or or put it in the exact right spot every single time and was just nowhere near it. Uh, he didn't have a great game, uh, but certainly uh, did what he needed to do over the course of 90 minutes uh, to keep Galaxy off the score sheet. But 
Yikes. Matty did not have a great game. Uh, he hammers that corner uh, almost into the 32-52 in the 11th minute. And then uh, he misses a shot well wide of McCarthy after the pass from Kike Oliveira in the 13th minute. And then Philly, I, I don't know what you got until then, but something that, that really worried me as much as, as Himothy made me want to, to jump and scream in the fourth minute, he also made me kind of want to jump and scream in the 20th minute. The 20th minute. Uh, what do I have for the 20th minute? Oh, the yellow card. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, we had a bunch. Of, we had a lot of fouls in this yeah. game. A, a significant amount. I think we like out fouled the Galaxy by what? 13. I think it was 20 to 7. And Correct. we piled up on those yellow cards relatively early. So Tillman gets the yellow card early on. And that obviously is a problem because we need to be very defensive in that midfield. And now you're going to take away Tillman's ability to be aggressive going up against the likes of a Ricky Pooch, so on and so forth. But despite getting a yellow card so early, he really played a great game and he was still aggressive. He played smart. I think that goes to show you that he's improved in a lot of ways, not only on his ability to be in the right place at the right time, to collect an assist here and there, but to maintain some of that maturity that players oftentimes don't display. We've seen it even going back to last season where, you know, Timothy would kind of lose his cool a little bit and find himself in situations. Now, if you could kind of teach Jesus David Mario a little bit about that, we would be in fine spirits. But all these yellow cards accumulating early on in the game, not necessarily the thing you want to see uh, against a team as aggressive as, as the LA Galaxy. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to say, Philly, I think it was Murillo who showed that once again. I mean, he picked up a yellow in, what, the 44th minute, right, and was still able to play the entire second half. I, I asked asked him about that in the press conference. It really seems like he's taken the next step. He kind of he, he gave a very coach-speak, player-speak answer uh, when I asked him, is it is it because you were playing with Giorgio for 18 months or, you know, you've taken kind of veteran leadership and all of that? Um, and and he, was, he was very complimentary with his answer about everybody, but I, I just – you know, I, I would have liked to hear a little bit more honesty from Mario in that. Like, yeah, no, I was fine. 45 minutes. I could play with on a yellow. I'm good to go. But that's okay. He's not that type of player. Uh, but it's it's Atuesta is the one that I, I tended to worry about more with the maturity now. I mean, he already has, what, four or five yellow cards on the season. Uh, did not get one in this match, which was great. Hopefully he got a little talking to. Uh, but, you know, Philly, honestly, like from the 21st to the 29th minute, we traded possession. We had a couple decent opportunities. Uh, you had Denny Bwonga getting fouled. You had Ricky Pooch getting fouled. Uh, a nice little one-two every now and then by the Galaxy. Uh, another awful corner by Matty Bogush in the 24th minute. But uh, Kiki Oliveira, Philly, that shot was like a, it was like with his toes. It wasn't even off the inside of his foot. Uh, in the 24th minute, uh, a great save by John McCarthy there. An easy save by John McCarthy. And I want to keep uh, – keep thinking about Oliveira towards the end um, of the, of the first half as well. Actually, no, into the second half. I would say he played a pretty good game minus his shots on goal. I think he found Denny. We'll, we'll go into that later. Let's just, we'll, we'll hold off on that. All right. Well, well, tell me a favor, Philly. Can you break what? down the goal and the chaos and the ridiculous? Total chaos. That's exactly how, the first word I have to describe it. And, and, and I have to take the blame for this defenders. I I'm sorry. Philly's. Philly's going to describe what happened because it's my fault that they scored. I was sitting in my seat and I turned and I said, I got to go pee. I'll be right back. And because I got up from my seat, as soon as I walked into the bathroom, I heard commotion outside on the pitch. Philly, I'm sorry. I take the blame for it. Can you describe what happened while I was in the bathroom? Well, chaos and drama. And by the way, it's in your hand. What? What's that plastic in your hand? Is that a crest strip? Did you not brush your teeth today? No, I have a I have a Giorgio Chiellini card in my hand. Oh, oh, all right. Anyways, chaos and drama in the box. You have a shot that goes off the post by Auda. Then he gets it deflected back to him, blocked. And then Gabriel Peck has a his shot blocked. And then Auda gets the equalizer. There was only so much the defense could have done right there. And just such a goal that you would see in this El Trafico rivalry, just complete chaos. We got lucky that out his shot hit the post. Nobody there to clear it. The fact that he had a couple of attempts blocked showed that the, the defense went back there, but then 
unfortunate that we allow this team to creep themselves back into the game with the equalizer, 29th minute, and now one-to-one is what the story is. And, of course, we're all thinking, oh-ish. Like, this is not what we wanted to see. But we, what do we do in those situations other than throw the uh, the kitchen sink uh, at the Galaxy? There was just there's as many block attempts as you can possibly have without them finding an opportunity to sneak one in. And credit to Auda, he was there. Uh, and he stuck with it. I mean, one shot off the post, one shot block, boom, he gets rewarded with a goal. And look, Philly, the one thing we know is in the Derby, there's going to be one or two moments that are just frenetic. You, I think your hashtag, right, is frenetic flamingo today. Yes. Uh, I There's going to be one or two moments that are just frenetic, uh, whether it's an unlucky moment because a ball hits an arm in the box and they call a PK, or there's chaos and the ball ping-ponging around, find somebody. Look, it happened to them with Timothy Tillman and his chest on the back post. It happened to us with Julian Aude, able to poke it in to the uh, to the right of A or to the left of A diving Hugo Lloris. Uh, and look, it happened again in the 31st minute. You can whine, you can complain, you can question the call, but here's the deal. I want to say one thing about the PK. If they wouldn't have called it, VAR would not have awarded it. But because they called it, VAR was not about to take this one away as well. I'm not sure there's clear and inconclusive evidence, but I will say this. When, was it Yamane, right? Yamane was the one that went to ground on this one? Yes, correct. When Yamane went to ground as early as he did on Denny Bowanga, then what that meant was he was leaving himself open to a bunch of pro referees that are still shaking off the cobwebs and knocking off the rust. And in that case, because Yamane went down so early, Denny Bowanga, I think you said in the press conference, right? He made the necessary actions to to earn the penalty. It was something like that from Denny Bowanga. So I don't fault the referee. I don't fault Denny Bowanga. I fault Yamane for going to ground so early. The PK was called. VAR in the 33rd minute. In the 34th minute, we got the PK confirmed. In the 35th minute, Denny Bowanga lines up for the PK. And Philly, he struck it with confidence right down the middle. And just like that, the answer just two minutes later it's Denny Boanga with a goal from the spot, and we're up 2-1. Now, going up against John McCarthy, somebody who we saw as a specialist in these types of moments, Panda and I were talking about this going, oh, boy, like this is going to be an issue because you know, you know at the end of practice that both those players would line up 12 yards from each other and just make several attempts to train for, uh, for one another. Denny doing his thing, John McCarthy getting blocks. And in the press conference, Denny had mentioned the fact that he likes to go left, and it's known that he likes to go left. Uh, <laughs> he didn't go left as far as his PK was concerned. He went right down Broadway, and J-Mac actually went the other way. He didn't go left. He went right. Left if you were watching it on the screen. But if there's anybody I would ever want in a situation with the game on the line, in a PK, in, in 11 meters away from the goalkeeper, it would be that of Denny Buwanga. He is a perfect five for five uh, since joining LAFC in 2022. I didn't have that kind of confidence in Carlos Vela, stemming back to what you referred to earlier, that game uh, against DC United in 2019. Denny Bowanga has been perfect. He has been clinical, and he uh, scores his second goal from the penalty mark. And now, all of a sudden, we're up two to one. Things still feel good, but minorly nerve-wracking. Yeah, look, John has not been as good lately on penalties as he was for us in MLS Cup, which, by the way, is fine, John. All we needed you to do to do was what you did in MLS Cup, so thank you. Uh, but either way, it uh, he struggled with such confidence. He put height on it, too. Uh, I think that apart from John McCarthy just choosing not to move at all, there was no way that that shot was going to be saved in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I got to ask, for those of you in the 32-52, in the 40th minute, there was a a new chant or a chant that I was not familiar with. Can somebody who's in our chat 
or somebody on social media, please respond to me uh, in the 40th minute. What was this new 3252 chant? Uh, it had something about like uh, something LA football club, Dale LA football. I don't, it was hard to understand. I was also trying to focus on the match, uh, but there was, seemed like it was a new chant uh, in the 40th minute, which was kind of neat. Philly, uh, I'm, as you know, uh, and, and I haven't been able to bring this up in a long time, so it feels good to be able to talk about this. And I know Philly's going to be very excited when I bring up the, uh, the greatest living American himself, Tom Brady, who was yeah. an incredible quarterback in his time, yeah. able to throw dots all around the football field. Just dots. I mean, seven Super Bowls, you name it, incredible. Well, Hugo Lloris did his best Tom Brady impersonation in the 43rd minute. God, I can hear our listeners aiding me right now. In the 43rd minute, a 60-yard dot from Hugo Lloris to Kike Oliveira streaking up the right-hand side. Unfortunately, we couldn't do anything with it. And I only brought this up so I could make Philly upset. Disclaimer, Kike Oliveira was wearing clothes because streaking <laughs> has a completely different meaning, at least in the world of a guy who was once in a fraternity many, many years ago. He was wearing his clothes. And thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Mikey A. I'm, I'm with you. Just filthy, disgusting. Nothing is going to upset a, um, a soccer-loving fan quite like bringing up not only Tom Brady, but the New England Patriots. But I have just the thing for you later. And it, uh, Tom, uh, Tom, Chris Lafferty uh, referenced it. Going forward as we're to the half, I'm not exactly sure what, what Vanny yelled at to, to the officials, to John Friedman, but he got dinged with a yellow card. And actually both coaches got dinged with a yellow card today. I don't recall the last time that's ever happened. Galaxy had a couple of attempts, 42nd minute. Peck had a curler that was saved by Lloris. Uh, Moody gets a yellow card, first foul on Ricky B. Uh, and you don't, I don't have to tell you what the B stands for as far as that's concerned. Uh, bad clearance, conceding a corner by uh, by Murillo shortly after that. Painsel to take the corner, nothing there. We had seven minutes of stoppage time, which obviously is seven minutes too long. Nothing really transpired. 45th plus fourth minute. Uh, foul outside of the box by Palencia on Painsel. Uh, another stupid foul call on, on Atuesta. That's really your first half. Heading into the locker room, up 2-1. Galaxy had a vast majority of possession, which goes to what the tactics were for Steve. I think Steve absolutely outcoached Greg Vanny, no doubt about it. But what was the interesting statistic for me is the Galaxy really not only controlled possession, but passed the ball accurately. I don't recall the last time a, a, a team had gone an entire half uh, with 91% passing accuracy against LAFC. Uh, that's pretty damn solid. You might see that at Bayern Munich games, not necessarily in Major League Soccer and not necessarily by the Galaxy in the last several years. 269 accurate passes, 91%. Uh, but this the foul situation is where we led. But we also led going into the half. We hit our XG and a uh, nice 15-minute break to go get ice cream afterwards. Yeah, and again, and I'll talk about this after the fact, but I absolutely think that Carson played directly into everything that LAFC wanted them to do, regardless of the possession numbers, regardless of the passing numbers. I think it was absolutely brilliant, again, by Steve Cherundolo. Uh, We got, you know, look, there was, this was a weird second half because I think LAFC had settled in to a low block so well I mean, they settled into a low block so well. And and the back line and Ilya Sanchez, who dropped back and essentially played like a fifth man on that back line for most of the match, they controlled everything, almost everything that the Galaxy did each and every minute of that second half. Dare I say, it was it was kind of a boring but controlled Second half, LAFC, Philly, correct me if I'm wrong. Galaxy had one shot on target, I think, in the second half. One? I think. Mm, give me a moment. I have things broken down in halves. I think. Uh, at the conclusion of the game, they had 18 total shots with four of them on target. They did do something that 
we normally don't get beat in. They hit the woodwork more times than we did. They did. But they did not hit the woodwork once this game. Amazing. I, I think they only had one shot. I mean, again. and, so and Hold on. Can, You're talking on target or just in general? On target. Yes, you are correct. They had one. Yes, they had three in the first half. I Again, Four this overall. is LAFC controlling the match. I don't want to hear about, oh, possession was 68-32. Oh, they outpassed us completion by 350 passes. Oh, they're – No. Look at their XG. Look at what they were able to do to be dangerous. Absolutely nothing. And that's what I said coming in this match. You talk about how Galaxy has completed a thousand. I talked about it, not you, like the Royal U. I was the one talking about it. Where Galaxy has completed a thousand more passes and their eye test, they just look better. And they've got all, doesn't matter. Their XG coming into this match was only 0.8 more than ours, despite scoring, what, four more goals than we have? I, I just did not think that this club was as good with the eye test, or excuse me, as good on paper as they were with their eye test. And we showed that exactly the entire 90 minutes. I was so proud of this club. Uh, look, we can go through it if we want minute by minute, but yeah. I, I really do think, Philly, that if you look at those last 45 minutes with the impotent offense being run by Carson, was all due to the fact that Steve Trundolo and that game plan was absolutely perfect over the course of 90 minutes. But, but Philly, I do want to talk about something that Steve Trundolo talked about uh, in the press conference, and that was how not to see out the match by LAFC. There were a couple of things, Philly, and you and I talked about this too, where instead of controlling possession, holding the ball, taking the air out of the stadium for Carson, we would take a quick shot and all of a sudden Carson's countering real quick. Happened in the 65th minute, happened in the 75th minute. I think it happened one more time again after the 80th minute. All we needed to do was hold the ball, but we tried to do a little bit too much at times. There was one play where Kike Oliveira was completely wide open, caught a nice pass, and it was really just one-on-one -on -one between him and John McCarthy. And I've watched this replay on, on, on multiple occasions. The thing that irritates me so much about it is he was just too froggy. He jumped too soon from one lily pad to another. An extra step. Maybe go to the side of McCarthy, and now you have a clear open look on goal. That, th that That's what frustrates me about Oliveira. Other than that, I will tell you that I think he play had a great game in terms of creating opportunities and nearly getting a dime to, to, to Denny Buwanga, which we'll address as well. But had we gotten those opportunities, had that extra step happened, had this play that I'm sure you're going to talk about with Denny Buwanga transpired, this is no longer a two-to-one game. The nail in the coffin, the door gets shut drastically we don't have to go in to stoppage time biting our cuticles and our fingernails they do need to do a better job closing out games especially with a team that's dangerous that can come from behind and 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 cut and, and get themselves back into a game stealing a point uh i we got lucky to be completely honest with you in a lot of ways uh, we were unlucky in a couple of waves, but fortunately, the soccer gods did not curse us with what happened. You miss a sitter, you miss a wide open look, and you think, all right, this is going to come back to haunt us and bite us in the rear. Fortunately, it did not because they only had one shot on target. To your point, you're absolutely right. I mentioned the Bayern Munich thing with the LA Galaxy uh, not too long ago due to the fact that, yeah, Bayern can pass the ball all they want, 91%, but they're not scoring goals and they're getting beat by bad teams. We're not a bad team, though, so just take that parallel out of it. It was um, That was the only thing I would say I was somewhat frustrated about. And obviously, Steve echoed that in the press conference as well. So I phrased the question like this to Denis Bawanga in the press conference. And I thought about this literally the entire time. Once we saw, and, and Philly, I'm blanking on her name, the, the French translator for LAFC. She has always been so nice to us, and I'm a jerk for not remembering her name right now. I apologize. Yeah, sure. I, <laughs> you don't know her name either, but either way, uh, I it might be Laura. I don't know. I could be wrong. It's probably not, but I, I apologize. Good morning, Mario. Uh, look, I phrased the question this way. 
I said, Denny, uh, goals from the spot have seemed to come easier for you this season than goals during the run of play. Uh, why do you think that might be? Is it that you've been unlucky? Is it that you're pressing a little bit? Is it that teams have, have made some good saves against you? Whatever it might be, why do you think that is? And as soon as I said goals from the spot, he gave me this look. It was this like sheepish, like, all right, so, so someone is going to ask about it. I knew it was coming. And by the way, shout out to LAFC PR for putting Denny Bawanga up uh, for that match because I, I could see him not wanting to talk about it. So I look, I couldn't ask like, hey, Denny, what the hell happened in the 80th minute, bud? I, I, I wanted to ask it that way. But the the journalist, the, 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 the media guy in me had to figure out a way to ask it that way. And he he stood right up and said, look, I should have made it in the 80th minute. He was like, look, I know I missed one in the 80th, but I'm going to go back to training. I'm going to try a little harder. I'm going to you know, do what I can to keep putting our team in the right position to win. So I applaud him for standing up and, and answering the question. But Philly, what the deuce? Hello, Kitty wanted to concur that you are a jerk. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. That's yes. good. No. Th th that is all. Um, what the deuce? Yeah, your your thoughts on the sitter. <laughs> <laughs> he he had the celebration in his mind prior to scoring the goal. That's what he said. I mean, that's exactly what he said. He, he said, said, I was thinking about how to celebrate before I actually scored the goal. He it was a combination of Christian Ramirez. Brian Rodriguez and early season Kike Oliveira all wrapped into one. I was watching the Seattle Founders Montreal game when we got back home just to kind of relax. Same exact play, and they were able to execute it. And the reason why is because there wasn't an emphatic desire to absolutely mash the ball. Denny wanted to kill it, absolutely crush it. That's why he skied it. If he bumped it, He's looking at a brace on the day. He really wanted to smash that with authority. And as a result of that, he he, he paid the price for it. But to his credit, he goes, uh, that'll never happen again. And I'll work sure to, uh, to, to work harder and, and, and be better next time. But yeah, look, it, it happens to us. We've all done something prematurely before it was meant to happen at some point, I hope. I know Denny and myself and others aren't the only ones. Either way, that should have that should have been the nail in the coffin. That does leave the door wide open and unfortunately gives the other side a four-letter word called hope. And we can't leave a club like that with any kind of hope. We can't leave anybody with with hope. Forget who it is. You leave um, you miss opportunities like that. Normally, you 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 pay for them. Thankfully though, we did not. And damn it, I predicted 3-1 and it should have been 3-1 on that goal. I'm just saying I wanted it I, I just, oh, I'm so frustrated. Does that mean I was closer to being correct in my prediction because I did only think LAFC would win by one? I mean, sure. Uh, look, you mentioned Hope, oh, and in the 83rd minute, a great cross by Carson into the box. And when Murray jumped for the header and missed, and I saw the ball pop down to Gabriel Peck uh, on the left side of the box, all I thought was, oh, man, this is it. They figured out a way in the 83rd minute to get one. And luckily, Luckily, Peck pushes it well wide. It actually wasn't very close at all. And I thought Hugo actually saw it the entire way, so we would have been fine. But Philly, it's moments like those where team still believes they have hope. In the 88th minute, right after Diego Fagundes came on for Gaston Brugman, uh, we, we can't run the break well at all. And the Galaxy countered very, very, very quickly. And I think that's when Steve saw like, all right, hold on. I, I got I to gotta do what I can here on the sideline because the 11 guys out there are really having some trouble seeing out the match. Let me make a couple of subs, slow this damn thing down a little bit. Maxime Cheneau making his LAFC debut for Edward Atuesta in the 89th minute. And then Kai Kamara making his BMO stadium debut for Kike Oliveira in the 92nd minute, saw out those last three, what wound up being four minutes of stoppage time and Philly, a massive, massive win for this club. 2-1, three points, Derby Day in hand. Yeah, now we, we are 3-0-1 at home. 
three three and one on the season, ten points. That gives us uh, that leaves us tied uh, at the at least at the end of the game, tied fourth place in the Western Conference, uh, of just a mere three points behind the Vancouver Whitecaps. Yes, the Wait, first behind the who? The who? Vancouver Whitecaps. Jesus. Yeah, the first place Vancouver Whitecaps. That just sounds weird, if you ask yeah. me. We're uh, we're four one and three now, all time at home against the Galaxy during the regular season, unbeaten in our last five at home against them, going four. 0 and one we've uh, started to finally get games where we're getting goals because it was getting kind of scary when we hit the 300 plus minute mark not scoring goals timothy tillman is tied with denny bawanga for the amount of goals scored this season timothy tillman that's kind of cool i think he's already off to career highs in, in a lot of ways and denny bawanga five 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 for five baby since joining lafc for pk's and yeah, I would say it was a pretty darn good day. So hopefully many of you out there are nursing the joys of last night because it was something to celebrate. It's not the make or break game for LAFC. There's still so much football to be played. We still have other players waiting to hit our roster. We're not complete yet, but this is a good indication as to how good this team can be. Uh, Depth-wise, it wasn't a really good a illustration of it because we only utilize Chano and Kamara towards the end. So depth still somewhat of a concern, especially if any of those starters get hurt. But either way, it was a good result. The Galaxy's unbeaten streak is now over, and who better to end that than LAFC? Absolutely. And again, I, I've said this twice. This will be third time as a charm, and then I'll shut up. The game plan orchestrated by Steve Chirondolo, Ante Razov, Mark Dos Santos, uh, Oka Nikolov, uh, uh, and, of course, uh, our, our newest addition. Uh, so happy uh, for our, our former coach of LAFC2, now being elevated up uh, to the big club as well. Uh, an incredible game plan by our coaching staff. Uh, just uh, what an incredible job uh, by this club to – Put it out there during training over the course of a week. And, and I mentioned this before. We're now seven matches in. Our first 12 matches, 12 matches this season, are all a week apart. Seven home, five away. But that means we have a week in training to work on things, to plan, <laughs> to plan for whatever that club is going to throw at us. And I don't think we could have done a better job for all of you out there that shake a stick or an angry fist, or a wag of the finger at Steve Trundolo every single match where he does something that you disagree with, you all need to look at the 90-plus minutes that were played in this match against a very good and very talented Carson team and look at how pedestrian we made them look, look at how impotent we made them look on the offensive end of things, and look at how well, for the majority of the match, our 11 out there on the pitch carried out a game plan that was set in motion to perfection by this coaching staff, but doesn't mean a damn thing unless the players go out there then and actualize everything that was done out there on the training pitch. And I can't tell you how proud I am of this club. This was the watershed moment that I thought it would be for LAFC. And Chris Lafferty, you're hilarious. He is loud. The, the other thing I just want to address real quick, and then I've got to go because i got to drive to Riverside for a 1 o'clock baseball game. But you go into – I stayed so far away from Twitter uh, th this last week just because yeah. I'm tired of seeing the same old freaking arguments going back and forth with one another. But you know, <coughs> sometimes it's just fun to go on, especially after LAFC beats uh, the, the Galaxy. The the oh we got robbed by the referees. Oh, this is what MLS does for their their new fan their new you know plastic clubs. Were you not given so many favorable calls when y'all were good at some point? How dare you say we get the favorable calls? Y'all were the uh, since '96. Y'all were the front runners. Y'all were like the darlings of the league. Now and now, like you throw that on us. It's a, that really is the pot calling the kettle black. No story about that. No question about that. But at the same time, you got robbed by the referees. It was in the 31st minute. You had an entire hour to make up the difference, but you didn't because LAFC neutralized your team. Your stud, Ricky Pooch, was absolutely walked on a leash by LAFC. He did not look good. 
He did not look good at all. Turned the ball over on multiple occasions. Was not the Ricky Pooch that we were all expecting to see. So for all that crap that y'all talked, I hope you all suffer from halitosis this weekend. We win the first one. The series now is y'all have won nine times. We've drawn five times. And now we have won eight. The gap is narrowing. And today felt, last night I should say, felt really good. Today feels really good as well. Today felt really good. So continue to cry. We will bask in your pain and we will live to fight another day because you know that is the case. Fourth of July is right around the corner. But there's one thing we could all agree on between both fan bases, all banter, talk aside, no question, this is the best rivalry in Major League Soccer. No question. I would say one of the best rivalries in sports in North America period. I love these this, this derby match. It gives me anxiety, but it feels so good. Uh, it feels so rough when you lose, but it feels so good when you win. So that's all I wanted to say. I love it, my man. Uh, one quick date on the calendar. Saturday, April 13th, LAFC takes on Portland in their next match. 1.45 p.m. Saturday, April 13th at Providence Park in Portland. That's our next match. Philly's got to get off to Riverside. I should just stop talking in general because I sound like this. And you know, yes, you said one more thing. Oh, geez. Oh, Mr. Scar, yeah, damn yeah. you and damn Tom Brady. How dare you bring up his name? He is no longer relevant. But on another note, I hope puberty treats you well and that you sound better in our next encounter. Bye, Scarf. All right, head on over to DefendersOfTheBank.com. Hit the shop thing. Buy a T-shirt or a hoodie, or, or or a onesie, or whatever else you got. And you know how we like to end all of our episodes. Is that a landline? Like, you have a landline? I. It's my parents' line. You have a landline. Bye. Bye. <laughs>